Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. You know, it's been my pleasure to talk to you about the greatest works of our musical culture, and especially to bring to your attention some rarely heard masterpieces and unknown potential masterpieces that perhaps you haven't heard before, and just generally to share my love of music and the the infinite variety that awaits us as we explore the musical universe. But I'm also a critic. And because I'm a critic, that means sometimes I have to come to you with bad news. And sometimes doing the bad news is even more fun than doing the good news, I have to tell you. And this is one of those times because today I'm going to talk to you about the worst Russian symphony ever. And I mean, the worst Russian symphony ever we know is probably written by some nameless hack whose name we don't know and we don't know what it is. But I'm talking about a piece of music that we actually have multiple recordings of that gets played, not with too much frequency because it's horrible, but, you know, it, it, it's out there. It's out there and the composer should have known better. And that composer was Aram Khachatorian. And that symphony by Mr. Khachatorian was his symphony number two. An utter piece of trash by any standard. It's grotesque. It's so awful. And I'm just thrilled to be able to explain to you why I think that's so. Now, how do we begin? Khachatorian was a composer of really good, I think, ballet music. I love Genya. I love Spartacus. I mean the complete ballets. I think they are marvelous pieces. Spartacus, I, I think, deserves to be performed far more frequently than it is. Genya is problematic. The reason Genya is problematic, aside from the fact that it has the saber dance, which everybody loves, is because the plot well, it never really had much of a plot. It changed every time he produced it. But we know that it was a sort of socialist realist tract. And those things are not terribly popular. The story of Genya is as follows. Genya is a nice gal working on a collective farm in the Caucasus, diligently striving for the triumph of socialism. And she has a boyfriend who's a, a thug. And her boyfriend is you know, basically teams up with a gang of other thugs and together they do naughty things. And these naughty things jeopardize the inevitable triumph of the socialist project by, you know, putting the wheat harvest at risk. And so Gania does what any nice socialist girl would do. She rats out her boyfriend to the border guard slash KGB agent, Sergei, and they round up the bad guys and ship them off to Siberia somewhere to a work camp, and everybody does the saber dance. That's basically the plot of Genya, and so it's no wonder that we play the suite and not the complete ballet, but the music is marvelous. And here I have to be a little bit dogmatic. I'm never dogmatic, as you know, and just say, look, there's nothing wrong with being socialist realist, as Kachatorian was, I'm going to do Cachatorian rather than Cachatorian because it's easier on my throat. And, you know, and just play, you know, right music, which is tuneful and colorful and nationalistic and appealing to the masses. You know, lots of people did that. Aaron Copeland did it in Appalachian Spring and Rodeo and all those populist ballets. There's there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's well done. Because as I've said a billion times, there's just good music and bad music. And we don't have to worry about the philosophy behind it. We have to simply judge it by musical criteria. That is shapely form, colorful orchestration, good tunes, expressive depth, if it has any. You know, it, these are not these are, this is not rocket science. This is not difficult to figure out. And when he wrote his big ballets, Hachatorian was at his finest. He really was. He has great melodies, somewhat exotic perhaps, but they're wonderful. And, he, you know, he just, he, he got the nationalist color and flavor and, and the music is beautiful. I love the Masquerade Suite. 
or masquerade, if you want to call it that. The masquerade suite is wonderful. It's just got, I mean, the waltz is just tremendous. He's just got a gift of melody that's wonderful. So why then would he want to write a big, pretentious, bombastic, horrible sounding, screechy symphony? Actually, he wrote two. Let's be clear. There are three Cacciatorian symphonies. The first was sort of a, a student work, a graduating from the conservatory work that's also full of, of sort of local color, which is quite lovely. But, it, you know, his sense of form was always completely dysfunctional. And his sense of timing was even more dysfunctional when he was writing in large forms. And the stuff just drones on and goes nowhere. You know, the violin and, and piano concertos have lovely moments. They really do, um, but they are also a little bit formally dysfunctional, and it takes a little bit of work to disguise their their longers, but it can be done. They can be played, and again, they're colorful, romantic pieces that deserve some respect, I think. They really do. They're not that terrible, but symphonies are a different matter. They really, really are. And the reason is because when you write a symphony, you're, you're promising something to the audience. That promise is, generally speaking, supposed to be something on the order of um, an expressive journey um, of one type or another. It doesn't have to be deep. It can be happy. But if you're going to make it deep, you better not blow it. And in this symphony, boy, it is gachatory and blow it. It's terrible. He's trying to write a piece of tragic import and high, high seriousness because symphonies were considered to be highly serious, especially in the Soviet Union at the time. And the idea of having to do something of high seriousness on the one hand, which is on the other, full of populist melody and easy to digest um, for everybody. Well, those two things are not necessarily compatible in the modern orchestral style. And Khachatorian makes no effort to reconcile these opposing objectives. He really doesn't. I don't even think he was aware of them, to tell you the truth. Uh, he probably wasn't the brightest bulb in the musical chandelier, as they say. But even so, this symphony has a subtitle. The subtitle is The Bell. Well, I mean, it got a subtitle. Whether it really has that, I'm not quite sure. And, I mean, Cacciatore, he worked on it, he revised it, he polished it, he shined it up. He made every dismal little bit as exciting as he possibly could. And it just got worse and worse and worse as time went on, I think. He recorded it several times, even with the Vienna Philharmonic for Decca. And that recording kind of upholds the cheesy quality of the whole thing by being not very good sonically and kind of distorted at the climaxes, which actually sort of fits the piece. It really does. I have here, because I can play it for you, this Naxos recording with uh, Dmitry Yablonsky in the Russian Philharmonic, which has the good sense to sound as though it's ashamed of the whole enterprise by playing the the atrocious bits a little bit faster than Kachaturian himself did. Kachaturian, of course, was there to emphasize the weighty import of what he was doing. But Yablonsky is like, oh my God, let's get it over with. And I kind of like that. Even so, it lasts for 48 minutes. But I'm going to come back to this in a second because Kachaturian also wrote a one movement third symphony, which is possibly worse musically, if you can imagine such a thing. But because he called it symphony poem, which was very smart, he absolved himself of the responsibility of having to put anything together in traditional symphonic form, unlike the second, which has four interminable movements and seems to go on forever because the music goes nowhere. But the third symphony, it's got like 15 trumpets and an organ part and all this. Oh, it's just awful beyond, beyond all reckoning. But it's only 20 minutes long. So you can enjoy the awfulness and sort of dust yourself off when it's over. Take a shower, clean out your ears with some Haydn or Mozart, and you're, all, you're in business, right? Second symphony offers you no such respite. You're stuck. And, you know, the thing that absolutely absolutely convinced me of this music's awfulness was the passage in the finale. It has a motto. And the motto is a bell theme, which sounds just like a doorbell going off. I mean, it's supposed to be very tragic and very and very portentous. And it's, it's nothing of the kind. It's just silly sounding. And there's a passage of the finale where 
was supposed to be the the tragic apotheosis of the bell motive, which had been running through the whole symphony. The first time I heard this, I said, my goodness, this sounds like the attack of the Avon lady. You know, do you remember that? Avon Cosmetics, you know, you had, you know, the suburban housewives acting as door-to-door -door sales ladies running back and forth trying to sell like lipstick and other stuff. And I have here a sort of example to show you just what it sounds like while that atrocious climax is playing. Um, and I've, I've done this deliberately to show you what I regard as a, a visual analog to the absolutely cheesy tastelessness and musical vacuity of the entire enterprise here. So let me let me get here ready here. Um, ha ha, there we go. I need to take off my glasses and I need to take out how my bridge work because it always helps to be missing a tooth if you're going to be, uh, you know, a what I think this is, which is your local Avon lady dressed in a pantsuit carrying a sample case um, who's actually a serial killer running around killing suburban housewives. That's what this sounds like to me. And because I don't exactly look like that, I, I have to do my own my own analog. And I have some props here. Let's see, I've got, oh, the weapon, because I'm a serial killer, and the makeup. Don't ask me where this came from or why it's here, but it's some sort of, you know, flesh-toned toner thing that was sitting in my medicine cabinet, and I don't even remember why. So. Here we have the climax, the absolute climax of, of the tragic climax of Khachaturian's second symphony, subtitled The Attack of the Avon Lady. Here it goes. Get it? Need I say more? Um, I think the music speaks for itself, and I hope that image provided you some sense of my general feeling about it. Wait a moment while I stick my teeth back in. I'm having oral surgery here, and so I'm having some, some, ah, there we go. Oh, temporary bridge work, which is quite helpful. Now, if you thought that was gross and horrifying, there you go. Cachetoria's Second Symphony, gross and horrifying. And, and you know, I have no shame about it. Evidently, neither did Cachetoria. And that's the problem. See, you know, when we talk about musical taste, it's, it's always an issue, right? Taste is such a personal thing and, and partly a cultural phenomenon as well. What could be more tasteless, for example, than the first act of Die Valkyrie? you know, which is a celebration of incest. But Wagner gets away with it because it's in this sort of pagan, you know, break all the rules kind of setting. That was Wagner's philosophical thing, that there was this overwhelming love which conquers all moral, cultural, you know, bourgeois morality and strictures. And so he got away with it. Nothing is more tasteless than Salome. I mean, whoa! Talk about tasteless and vulgar and bloody and violent and repulsive and all the characters are disgusting. But Strauss gets away with it because, first of all, the music is top notch. You know, great music forgives all sins. It really does. And the technique behind all of the disgustingness is so fabulous and so refined and so comprehensive that he forces us to sort of go along with it, even though we're kind of grossed out by the time it's over. I mean, these are the way that we get away with this kind of stuff, right? And Mahler, for example, in his symphonies, Mahler was always derided for having music which was terrible, terrible taste. But Mahler's bad taste, first of all, was incorporated into his comprehensive worldview of what the symphony should be. And what's more, he used it he used it to widen and broaden the expressive depth of what music could do. It was, it was smart tastelessness. And if you're going to be tasteless, you've got to be smart about how you deploy it. 
And the problem with Cacciatore and his second symphony is that his vulgarity, of which the symphony is 90%, is, is completely mindless. It's absolutely mindless. It's just he thinks he's being heroic. He thinks he's being tragic. But the musical quality, the musical materials that he uses to try and express those feelings are totally, completely unsuited to the expressive trajectory that he so self-evidently is reaching for and so self-evidently is failing to achieve. So, for all of those reasons, the Second Symphony of Kachaturian gets my vote for most terrible Russian symphony ever. Absolutely horrible, a disaster from beginning to end. And, you know, like I said, listen to the ballets, listen to the other stuff. I'm not saying Kachaturian was always a bad composer. He just should never, ever, ever have attempted to write symphonies. Some people are good at it, some people just aren't. And one of the things I always said that I admired most about certain composers and talking about Hovhannes, we just did a talk on Hovhannes, or Mompu, who we also discussed recently, is there's something to be said for composers who know what they can do and stick to it. They know what they shouldn't do and they don't. Some do, some don't. I think that the pressure, if you are a Soviet composer, to make a grand statement in the traditional symphonic form um, was very, very great, and Kachaturian bowed to it, and these are the disastrous results. So that's my view. You can disagree with me. Feel free to disagree with me. It's okay to love trashy music. I like trashy music. I really do. But you know, trashy music that has fun. The fact that it's trashy, there's nothing fun about this thing. It's just a slog. It's a miserable slog. And on that happy note, I still recommend, above all, that you keep on listening, even to this dog of a symphony. Give it a shot. Make up your own mind. You don't have to agree with me. It's just my opinion. But there it is. Take care.